saved others. But he cannot save himself. Messiah is he? King of Israel? Then let him come down from that cross. We'll all become believers then. <laughs> <laughs> Give them, they know not what they do. Aren't you supposed to be the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Don't you fear God. You're getting the same as him. We deserve this, but not him. He did nothing to deserve this. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I tell you this truth. Today, you will be with me in paradise. God of truth. It, it's finished. This man was the son of God.
inside my spirit beckons from the hill. Sometimes I choose to visit, sometimes against my will. I take the longest. As though I hear some rooster crow And driven by a prayer I go To the cross
have such a profound visual as we have had this morning. It provokes a lot of thoughts in our hearts regarding the message of Christ and what we believe happened in history 2,000 years ago and even before this particular day in Jerusalem, in the Roman Empire, under the Caesar and his appointed leader, Punctius Pilate, and the Sanhedrin, the legal body in, of the Jewish people in Rome. If we could go back and take the veil of time away, we would see that Christ always has been and always will be. He called himself the I Am. And this was the reason why the legal authorities and the religious authorities in Israel had no more tolerance for him and his public ministry, which during periods of time was extremely popular and very effective, as the prophets said. We have a great advantage because we have the scripture. Without the scripture, we would not really understand the things that we understand today. There is a veil over the scripture. We could say something like this. When you read the scripture, and also when you look at this event, there is a veil over the mind of the person, the mind of a student, of a child, of a parent, of even a, a person that attends a church. It may be that they do not really see what is happening here. And in a few minutes, I want to describe it to you and explain it to you and ask that the Holy Spirit, who is our teacher, would show us the importance and the value and the meaning of what happened. Our first point is, that this person was unlike every other person that has ever existed. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, the scripture reads, God who at diverse times, various times, and in different ways spoke, in time past under the fathers by the prophets. What this means is that if you take your thumb and you go back through the scripture, you see that God spoke in different ways, dreams, miracles, visions, men, women. He spoke to the Fathers, these are the Jewish founders, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, um, David, Solomon. And he spoke to them in different ways by prophets. Not only the miracles, but also the messengers who predicted the future. Behold, your king comes riding on an ass, the foal of an ass, Zechariah 9.9. 9. This is Palm Sunday, the day we celebrate Christ riding into Jerusalem on a young donkey that had never been ridden before. The people crying out, Hosanna, 
salvation. Hosanna, Hosanna. But that is one prophecy. Another, they would gamble for his garments in Psalm 22, 18, mocking him in 22, 7 and 8. Born in Bethlehem, Micah 5, 2. The day he would die, Daniel 9, 24 to 27. This was all prophesied so that when we see it, we see the pieces come together and realize that this man was unlike every other. In which way? He was a king. When he spoke to Pilate, he said, Pilate said to Christ, are you a king then? Because they, he had heard that Jews said he has made himself to be a king. He has said he is the king of the Jews. And Pilate took Jesus aside and said, are you a king then? And Christ said something very interesting, which I think packages the whole picture here. And he said, do you say this of yourself or have others told it to you? It seems the tables are reversed. Are you a king? Have you said this from yourself, from your heart, from your own inquiry, from your own heart investigation? Are you saying this from your own thoughts or is just kind of talk on the street that you've picked up? That's a great statement. I think people believe, think about Jesus just like on the street or the steeple on a church or a cross on, as a piece of jewelry. Do you know who he is? Have you heard it on the street or heard about it from others? Or have you decided in your, are you asking from your heart who I am? He said to Pilate. And Pilate said, am I a Jew? And defended himself, and the text is interesting. This king is incognito. In history, there have been kings, English, Dutch, Scottish, French, that have decided to be kings. They were kings by birth, and they decided as kings to become common people for a while. They would take off their royal garb, walk amongst the common, take on an, another name, and be with them either to escape uh, arrest or capture or uh, to find out about common people and to be considered common. Uh, but this man was the son of God was God, and he became flesh, the seed of David, promised by the prophets. David's kingdom dynasty was reduced to a hut, Amos says in chapter 9. A, the, a great dynasty, David and his kings, Solomon, it's like a huge palace type of picture of a powerful and very wealthy kingdom reduced in hundreds of years to oh, an invisible line. It's a root or a stump that's gone underground. Where is the seed of David? Where is the seed of David? A blind man knew in the Gospels. When he cried out, son of David, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus walking stopped in Jericho. And it was blind Bartimaeus, though he was blind, he could see the king who was incognito, unrecognizable, not known by the people. This king this seed of David is the king of kings. 
He was a son of God. It says here in Hebrews 1, verse 2, He has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. God, have you and your Son made the worlds? The very tree he was crucified on, you and your son, are you holding everything together? Are you and your son one, like he said? And in this, in his work, his great work, we can hardly comprehend the depths of it and the reality of it and the meaning of it. You have appointed him to be the heir of all things, of the entire universe, and even beyond time and space, that you have highly exalted him, and you have honored him, then why did this happen? What is the meaning of this? Why did this happen? What, what did he do? Psalm 82 a psalm that I, I think just captures it in these words. Listen to this. I have said, you are God's small g. He is speaking to people. I have said, you are God's. What? I have said you are gods. Lord, we're more like animals. We're more like dogs and wild beasts and, and chimpanzees and gorillas. You know that. We've been taught that in school. That we come from the ground and we return to the ground. Actually, you said that. We came from the dust and we return to the dust. Could you speak to me? Again, and he said, I said, you are gods. What? What does that mean? You mean we are like gods made to live forever? We are like gods, we are made in your image? You mean we're something like angels, but not really angels? What are we, God? God said, I made you to be gods. I made you to be my children. It says here, verse 6, you are gods and all of you are children of the Most High. Oh, we are children of the Most High? Yes. Can you see the image of God stamped on your face or stamped on your heart? And we say, Lord, the people I work with are more like they're dangerous. God is saying, I made you to be children of the Most High. And then he says, but you shall die like men. But we will die like men, yes, you know, die, you know, cancer, car accidents, old age, you know, die, murder, bloodshed. Yes, Lord, every time that happens, I, I shake, I quiver. It doesn't fit. And God says the reason it doesn't fit is because I made you to be like God, to be gods. I made you not to die, I made you to be like gods or to be gods, to be spirit, to be eternal. I made you to be forever. I made you to be like me. I didn't make you to be like mud. I made you to be like an angel, and even more, like my son. My son came incognito, and you did not see him and recognize him. 
What did you do to him? We found him to be guilty. We found him to be offensive. We found him to be a liar. We found him to threaten us. We found him to be useless, of no value. And God could say, well, tell me, what did he do to hurt anyone? What did he do? Did he raise a sword to take somebody's head off? Did he lie to get a high position? Was he manipulative? Tell me, what did he do? Did he steal? Did he cheat? Did he destroy? <laughs> no, Lord. Pilate said, I find no fault in him. Why did we do it? Because the Lord said, But you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. What is that phrase? Fall like one of the princes. Where do we find that? But Lucifer was in heaven, and he was a chief prince, the most wise, the most beautiful, and he fell like lightning in Luke 10, verse 18. He came to this planet as an enemy of God, and men are made to be gods, but men now die like men and fall like the devil as an enemy. Men go to hell. Matthew 25, 41, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. He's, spo he's speaking there to men. When I was hungry, you did not feed me. When I was thirsty, you did not give me drink. And before the judgment, he said, at my left hand, I will say to those on my left hand, they were the goats on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire. I thought we were, I thought we were gods, and God said yes, and that is why it is eternal, because you are cursed, and it is eternal. And you die like men and fall like princes into hell. You are judged and you go to hell because of your sin. Let's take a look at our king, incognito, unrecognizable. What did he do? He took it. He took our sins on his body. You know, in psychology, they say there's like three ways to move a person. There's, you move them by force. You threaten them. That's like at work. You'll lose your job if you don't do a better job. I will not pay you. I'll not give you your paycheck unless you do this. You can move people by force, like by a sword, by threat of death, by threat of uh, demise. Another way of moving people is like with children. You carry them. You carry people. You do it for them. You teach them. You instruct them. But neither of these two work in a marriage. A marriage cannot, you cannot get married under force. You can do it, but it's not a marriage. And you cannot carry your wife or your husband like a child. There must be another way. And it's this way. It is being vulnerable. It is forgiving you. It is saying, I am here, vulnerable. And by this love, I draw you. You are drawn 
by the cross. Guys, I don't see Jesus forcing us to do anything. And I don't say Jesus is saying, ah, don't worry about it, I, I'll do everything for you. I'll do everything for you. Of course, he, sa it was all, he saved us totally by his work. And he has done everything in that sense. But now comes the question, will you decide? Will you say yes to him? Will you put your trust in him? Will you, will you recognize, you know, when he was born incognito as a babe in Bethlehem, very few people showed up, very few people recognized him, but there were some. And this by the Holy Spirit. And when he was a young man and his mother was watching him, uh, she pondered it in her heart. There were some, I mean, she in that sense when he's 12 years old. And then when he starts his ministry, it was John the Baptist who recognized and saw him. And then the disciples, there were some. And then at the, at the death of Christ, there was the centurion who undoubtedly had killed many men in his life was a leader in a barracks, a, a group of a hundred men. He was a tough guy. They, the top, pecking order, number one alpha male. He's the guy. But on this day, he meets somebody who's God. God. God speaks, forgives, suffers, and dies. They were mocking him in the early morning hours at nine, the trial from six to nine, the pressure on Christ standing alone. Everybody has forsaken me. And let's close with this thought. There's a thousand messages in this. At this one, think of this. Six to nine, they bring him to Pilate at six in the morning. There's talking going on, and Christ is standing. He has been beaten through the night by the soldiers of the Sanhedrin. They put a, sh a thing over his face. He's been to Herod's place. Uh, they blindfolded him and beat him. Uh, and they prophesied, they mocked him, saying, Prophesy, who hit you? blindfolding him, hitting him, punching him, plucking his beard, and said, prophesy, who hit you? I was thinking of some of this, uh, poor, this blasphemous, what they call it, art. One of them, the crucifix in a jar of urine in some, some art exhibition that has been in the papers through the years. Give it your best shot. Mock him, ridicule him, blaspheme him. The blasphemy of the Son of God can be forgiven. The blasphemy of people through the ages as they do not know what they are saying. This is what he said in Matthew 27, 43. Forgive them, they know not what they do. I was putting names on that. Who, who doesn't know? Punctious Pilate doesn't know. Caiaphas, I think he had that in his mind. Forgive Punctious Pilate. He doesn't know what he's doing. Forgive the centurion. He's doing his duty. Forgive Caiaphas, the high priest, and Ananias, his father-in-law. And forgive them. And everybody involved in my trials, and Herod, Forgive them, forgive them, forgive them. They know not what they do. And that forgiveness was deep in his heart. He sees forgiveness as powerful. He sees forgiveness as better than judgment. A judgment without mercy, but mercy rejoices over judgment. Here we are drawn. 
We are drawn by love. You know, you can force somebody by withdrawing their pay. You can do it for them by carrying them. Or you can draw people in their heart. And in the right time and the right place, and when the Holy Spirit takes the veil away, and you realize that this is the Son of God who became the Son of Man of flesh, the flesh of the King of David, who was promised, your seed shall be on a throne and reign forever and ever in Second Samuel seven eighteen. it's okay if the world mocks him because that's what sin sin we don't get it sin does this this is the peak or consummation of what sin is can you see it watch <clears throat> what is sin sin is sin is it's a shame uh, sin is uh, an a opportunity to mock, ridicule, degrade, despise. He was demonically despised by anybody and everybody who had any contact with him. It was the devil saying, ah, ha, 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 I enjoy this so much. That sin, the crown of it is this, hanging up naked, ridiculed, mocked, spit upon. You, you have a crown, don't you? Like the students who go to Florida on vacation, these children who go and party, and they have a crown. What is the crown of your sin? The crown is not a crown of honor, dignity, Glory, it is a crown of shame and pain and alienation. Do you think that, that, that sex produces connection and real love? And living a life where you, are, you can do anything you want to is to your honor? It is to our shame. My sin is here. My sin is shameful. My, I'm fascinated how people can kick people to the curb because of their sin. You have sinned, and it hits the internet and goes everywhere. He has sinned. The sin is, ah, ha, ha. We have an opportunity to put it up and show the whole world and alien, and mock, ridicule, accuse, and attack, and laugh, and sh scorn on this foolish idiot that has sinned. If that's true, can you imagine that God took our sin? when it contradicts him, when it's the opposite, instead of a crown of thorns, a throne of holiness, instead of shame, honor, dignity, we long for that because we are gods. It says there, I have said you are gods. And all of you children of the Most High. Can you feel it? You cannot get a hold of it until the Holy Spirit comes into your heart. And you sense that's true. That's true. I am a God. But I have no ego in it. We have no, I do not mean it arrogantly. I can only say there it is that God did not make us to die, but to live forever, that he, he, he did this so that we would not have it. He did this so that we would be crowned with honor, that his, the human being would be like 
him. That we would have this love and sense of our calling and our purpose. And we would love it. We would love it. We would follow him and follow him. When they took him to bury him, the women took note where he was buried. And Joseph of Arimathea, and it was the Passover, and they couldn't work on the next day. This, the Sabbath had started. And, and so first thing in the morning, because love draws us. Yes. This spring in church, in our church, and I hope in all churches everywhere, we would have Bible teaching on the meaning of Christ and what he did. That you as a believer, if you are a believer, then you should feed your spiritual life. You should ask questions. You should investigate. You should be vulnerable also and say, I need help before God. God will help you. You say, I would like to grow. I'd like to learn more. I'd like to learn this book from the beginning to the end. I'd like to follow him and know him because if they knew him in Bethlehem, if they knew him at the Jordan River, if they knew him in the temple, if they knew him at the cross, and if they knew him at the resurrection scene, if they knew him at Pentecost, and by the way, the good news is, listen, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. What happened 50 days later at Pentecost? 3,000 Jewish people believe in him. Not a small number. There's no one with him now. But in some days, 3,000, then 5,000. Then they are in Korea. Then they are in China. Then they are in Africa, not chronologically, but in principle, they are all over the world and through every age. Do not be misled by Hollywood and movies and the press and the articles and the common talk on the street. I like that. Did you, Pilate, are you saying this from yourself or have others? Uh, the media, the word on the street, do you know who I am? Of course he didn't. What about you? Would you pray with me? What do you say? Do you know? What can you do with your sin if you keep it in your bosom, keep it in your heart, hide it, regret it, curse it, hate it? What can you do with your sin it is eating you away, maybe, eating you up, or it, you're afraid of it. You're afraid you would do something that would hurt yourself and hurt many others. You're afraid of your own self. You're not sure what you're capable of. What can you do with it? But come to the cross and look. Ask God to show you. This was not just simply a martyr for some teaching of some wayward. This is the Christ, the accurate one, the de designated one, the confident one. When he spoke many times, you say, verily, verily, I say unto you. It means with absolute confidence that it is not even questionable. I am telling you with a total guarantee, it is like so. I know I have come from my Father. I am unlike everybody else in my birth and unlike everybody else in my death. And like everybody else in my designated, 
purpose and designated reward. No one is like me, but I invite you into my kingdom. Believe in me. Simply believe in him and say this simple prayer, Lord Jesus, I believe in you in my heart and save me, show me. You might say, I've been to church. We know this. We have been through it too. We've been through the drill, been through the routine. Maybe it was more for you than that. Maybe church was important and vital. But the big question only you can answer is, have you put your trust in Christ for your salvation? Or are you trying to be good enough You'll never be good enough. You must be born again. You'll never make it on your own. You must put your trust in him personally. In this church or any other one where you hear that message of believing in Christ personally. If you are believing this morning in your heart, then the ushers would give you a booklet. It's just for your encouragement and for, it, for you to recognize that we recognize your decision is between you and God. Would you just put your hand up in the air in the auditorium? Thank you. God bless you. Somebody else, thank you. God bless you. Beautiful. The ushers will give you something in, in the back on the right. Anyone at all? Anyone at all? Yes to Jesus. Anyone? Yes to Jesus. Thank you.